Hey family, Kevin Wallace here from Redemption to the Nations Church. We've got a message for you today that I believe God gave me to bring strength and hope and joy to your journey. I want you to get your heart open. I want you to get ready to receive this word. I don't believe your life's ever gonna be the same again. God's getting ready to take you to a new level. I'll see you at the end of this message and we'll pray together. God bless, enjoy this word. Change is coming. Look at somebody and tell your neighbor, change is coming. Change is coming. Second Kings 6, 24. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it. Say besieged. Until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Then, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today. Look at this. And we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked. And there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Next verse, please. Then he said, Go, then he said, God do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now, what I want you to understand is we're getting ready to read the 32nd verse and the 33rd verse, and most people stop right there. But Chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 is simply a continuation of this story. And so I'm going to read 32 and 33, and then we will proceed to read verses 1 and 2 of the next chapter, and we will see the connection. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door. Hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he was still talking with them, there was a mess, the messenger coming down to him. And when the king, and then the king said, surely the calamity, this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Look at the next verse. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Somebody say, hear the word of the Lord. Somebody say, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, in fact, you will see it with your eyes, but you will not eat of it. Look at your neighbor before we preach for a few minutes today and tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, come on here. I need some faith in this house on this message this morning. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't believe it, you came too late because I've heard the Lord in prayer this week. And I believe by this time tomorrow, change is coming. So somebody in Athens, look at your neighbor. Somebody in Chattanooga, look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, it might have taken years. It might have been weeks. It could have been months. But tell them I believe by this time tomorrow. Tell them at the word of the Lord, change is coming. Change is coming. Change is coming. If you believe it, shout yes. yes. Father, help me preach today. Help me prophesy today. 
May the spirit of wisdom and revelation rest on us in Jesus' name and the people of God said amen. amen. Can be seated in the presence of the Lord. The text before us today is perhaps one of the darkest chapters in the history of Israel. In fact, Israel was in a place of near complete and total apostasy. It is a dark time. Pluralism and people turning from God everywhere you look. The people in the nation of Israel had become contaminated with this idea of unbelief and skepticism and they had turned their back on Yahweh. There is this lone prophet that wears the mantle of the prophetic anointing who operates in the power of God in this day because God will always have a witness. And I don't care how backslid a nation becomes, God will always have somebody with a backbone who will not allow truth to fall to the ground and will stand with God and declare God's word. And I recognize that we live in a tumultuous time and we turn around and we look in all directions for comfort and we find little. But there is still a God in Israel and there is still a God in America and there is still a God over the nations of the earth. And while kings conspire, Psalm chapter 2 says that the Holy One sits on his throne and laughs at the plans of men. I don't want you to get mixed up in your mind about the mess that we see happening around us and start thinking that God has somehow lost control or that God is somehow nervous or that God is somehow in a mess. God is all powerful and nothing has ever changed about who he is and the power he has. And what I see happening in 2 Kings, actually it's the first six or seven chapters of 2 Kings. We, we keep going from one chapter of darkness to another. We keep seeing one act of deplorable uh, activity after another. It's just one, one, uh, one saga, one sad story, one mess after another. And we keep seeing a picture of darkness painted by the writer of 2 Kings, and we come to the sixth chapter of 2 Kings. And in this dark chapter in Israel's history, God begins to work in Israel to bring them back to his heart and his purpose. And I want to tell you that sometimes trouble is there to get your attention. Sometimes trouble is there to remind you that you need the Lord. Y'all don't have to say amen about it today, but some people won't pray until they have some trouble. Some people don't go to church until they find themselves in some trouble. In fact, some people won't get in a prayer line until they're on their way to jail. I want to tell you today that I don't need trouble to pray, but if you need trouble to pray, there's enough trouble happening in the world to cause everybody to come to prayer meeting tonight. Because the world that we live in is a world that is filled with trouble. And sometimes God works through the trouble to get our attention. And in the second, king, second chapter, a second book of Kings, the sixth chapter, we are told that this Syrian army shows up to Samaria and they come to besiege it. And the first thing I want you to see is the attack of the enemy. Everyone say the attack of the enemy. Now, we don't want to preach too much about the enemy on a Sunday morning because I don't believe the devil needs any glory. I don't believe the devil ought to be credited. I don't believe the devil ought to be magnified or glorified when we come to church. I believe when we come to church, we ought to talk more about Jesus than we do the enemy. Say amen, somebody. But I do think it is pro appropriate and proper for us to help identify the schemes. The Bible said in the book of Corinthians, be not ignorant of the devil's schemes, of his devices, of his methods of operation. Because Satan has a strategic way in which he works against your life and mine. It's not a new devil, it's not a new scheme, it's not a new strategy. And if we can understand by looking at this text how Syria uh, was used by the enemy to come against the people of God, I think it can help us understand some of the stuff that somebody in this room is going through this morning. The first thing I want you to see is the attack of the enemy. The Bible said that Syria besieged Samaria. 
Now this is interesting because besieging a city is not a sudden attack. It is not a violent strike. It is not a surprise attack of missiles and bombs and, 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 and all kinds of artillery and all kinds of weaponry. When the Bible says that Syria besieged Jerusalem, it is a long haul tactic of warfare. And what they would literally do when they besieged the city is that they would surround the city and begin to choke off what came in and to choke off what went out of the city. If you are going to use the tactic of besiegement as a weapon in a war, you are not interested in an immediate, uh, uh, you are not interested in an immediate spontaneous victory. You are looking to long term choke the life out of the city by keeping it from receiving what it needs and releasing what it ought to. And the Bible said that many years, look at the text here, many years the Syrians besieged Samaria and they systematically and, and repetitiously and with great confidence they choked off all of the supplies necessary to set to, to, to bring the city into a place of vitality and life. Years of this, they besieged the city and tried to shut it down. Years of choking the life out of it. It was not a spontaneous, instantaneous, quick thing. It was a long-term uh, uh, strategy of sucking the life out of a city. And I want to tell you right now, when I look at the enemy's attack, I want you to know that as your pastor, I see that the enemy is not interested necessarily in an instantaneous, spontaneous, immediate defeat in your life. He is absolutely satisfied with seeing you and I go through a long, drawn out, uh, of defeat where just systematically over time the enemy chokes the life of God out of the believer. Come on, churches don't just die overnight. Churches die after years of being choked out. The enemy comes in and he puts a little bit of gossip in the church. Y'all not going to say nothing. And he puts a little bit of division in the church and he puts a little bit of religion in the church and he puts a a little bit of compromise in the church and to, until finally you don't wake up one morning immediately and the church not have victory but a decade after a decade of compromise and listening to the voice of the enemy and suddenly churches that were full of vitality now are empty and there's no one getting saved in the altar and there's no one getting healed in the prayer line why because the enemy will be satisfied to choke the life of God out of us in your own personal life, if you take inventory, very rarely have anybody in this building lost it all overnight. Most of the time, our defeats are long-term. They are calculated by the enemy. It's one blow after another. It's, it's that systematic, slow process of choking out our hope. Come on, somebody. Choking out our joy. Set, sending setback after setback until we are not full of hope anymore. We are full of disappointment. And we get so full of disappointment with God that we start believing the reports of the enemy and the enemy he wins when we cease to believe God and start believing the report of our adversary it's a besiegement it's the choking out the slow systematic process of choking the life of God out of the people of God and what is the aftermath of the attack the attack was besiegement but what is the aftermath verse 25 the 6th chapter says that the aftermath of the attack, look at this family, the aftermath was that people were buying and eating donkey heads. You don't go to a restaurant looking for a donkey head. No one lines up in the fast food line, goes through McDonald's and gets a number six donkey head, mega size. Come on, somebody. The point is that the besiegement had choked out the clean thing. So much so that they changed their diet and they began to eat the unclean thing. 
See, that's what the enemy will do. He will choke you out until you stop eating a clean diet and you start eating. You understand that a donkey's head is unclean. The Jewish people were not supposed to be eating donkey heads. It's not kosher. But the reason they're eating donkey heads is because they were besieged and they were choked out and they were desperate for anything. And when you lose the value of what is clean, you start feasting on the unclean. God help me preach right here. And that's what besiegement does to a people. It gets them compromising and they start eating what is forbidden and participating in what God has said no to. Not only were they eating Donkey heads, but this is even crazier. They are eating dove droppings. And here's the crazy thing. They're paying good money for dove droppings. When the enemy besieges you and I and our lives and the people of God, we find ourselves eating things that are the leftover of the dove. We don't have the dove. All we have are dove droppings where the dove used to be. We pay, that's what's happening in many places in the kingdom of God. We don't have the dove flying around. We have dove droppings and all we do is talk about when the dove dropped by. And when the dove drop by, when the dove leaves, I don't know about you, but I want the dove to stay. I don't want dove droppings. I need the dove. Y'all better help me in this room today. There are too many churches that are feasting on the dove droppings and not the dove. The Bible said in the book of Matthew that when Jesus come up out of the Jordan River, that the, the dove of the Spirit descended on Jesus and rested on him. And the book of John said that the dove never left him. I don't know about you, but I want the dove to stay with us today. I want the dove in my life. I want the dove in my family. I want the dove to help me raise my children. I want the dove to help me be a husband. I don't just want the dove on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. I need the dove when I'm raising my babies and when I'm helping them select college. Come on, somebody. We need the dove in all that we do. And some people are satisfied having dove droppings. Churches that are satisfied with this, they will talk to you more about their history than they do their destiny. I always get nervous when I go to a church and they talk to me about what's happened but not what's happening. I'm telling you right now that if there's ever been a time the church need to be in a move of God, it's right now. You ought to slap your neighbor and wake him up and tell him, neighbor, we need the dove. We need the dove. I don't know where this thing ever broke out and who gave permission to the people who ever thought we could have church without the Holy Ghost. Where in, this, where in the world did this mess come from? I am sick and tired of people thinking that religion will save and religion will heal and religion will deliver when in reality religion will hurt some people more than, more than the world will. We don't need where the dove used to be. We need the dove right now. But the saddest part of the aftermath of this attack is not that they ate donkey heads or dove dung without question the saddest part of what Israel had become is that the attack of the enemy and the longevity of the attack produced in them a nation, listen, that devoured their young and they operated in a spirit of cannibalism and they consumed their sons and daughters in the name of their own self-preservation. I'm getting ready to preach right now. When I think about the level of depravity that was prevalent in that day, that a mother would destroy the life and future of her own offspring, it blows my mind that a woman could give her child to another lady and both of them boil her child and eat and satisfy themselves on the body of their own children. But I want to tell you as much as that blows my mind, I want to warn us as a nation that we are not so far from this insidious, insidious path that we find Israel following in this text. In fact, although we have not resorted to physical cannibalism, 
We, ha- we, we don't have to look very far before we see the destructive tendencies of every sort of injustice and evil that is killing our children in the womb and in the streets, in the classroom, and even in the living room. Our sons and daughters need a generation of Holy Ghost-filled fathers and mothers who will love them, encourage them, guide them, bless them, and even correct them. If we are not careful, we will become so busy preserving our own lives and preserving our own careers that we will open the door for pedophiles to get their body, transgenders to get their identity, professors that want their brain, hell that wants their future, and pulpit pimps that some call pastors who only want their money. But God is going to raise up a church in this day that sees our sons and daughters and prophesy till a shift happens in this generation. I want to announce it in this house to every young son and daughter. You are not the church of tomorrow. You are the church of today. And we're not going to let you die by the grace of God. We believe in your future. Somebody shout yes. We do not need another son or daughter to be lost or left behind. You have a future. Come on, look at your neighbor, tell them you have a future. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people who should show forth the praises of the one that brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I believe this thing is going to shift. We've been doing a whole lot of talking in this nation over the last several years among the the religious and those who are in church circles. And we've seen the coming together of information between sociology and church and how these realities are mingling and what we have come to the painful yet accurate reality of is this, that we are losing sons and daughters in the church. But I want to tell you that thing is about to stop. Because God is about to turn the hearts of fathers to children. I feel this on me right now. The hearts of fathers to children and the hearts of children back to the fathers. It does not start with young people wanting to have relationship with fathers and mothers. It begins with fathers and mothers who will turn their heart towards sons and daughters and have a relationship with sons and daughters. I want sons and daughters to know that you don't have to go find your purpose in a crack house. You can find it in the house of the Lord. But in order for that to happen, somebody got to help us love those who are in a generation that the devil is so nervous about he understands the purpose of that young generation and he wants to kill them before they step into that purpose but I came to prophesy it's going to shift God is about to send a wave of grace and glory and touch the hearts of sons and daughters and you can't talk them out of what God's getting ready to pour into them The Bible said when this woman relayed this story, I feel like preaching here. Some of y'all look like y'all interested in going to eat. I release you in the name of the Lord, but I'm getting ready to feed somebody who's hungry spiritually because what we need in this hour is not another little chicken soup for the Christian soul. We need a word from the Lord that shifts situations and circumstances. It won't shift while we're sitting in a huddle talking about how bad it is, but it will shift at the word of the Lord. I came to preach today that the word of the Lord can change it all. The Bible said, the Bible said that this woman relayed this story to the king, King Jehoram of Israel. And when he heard this, he snapped. He said, I can't handle this anymore. He had heard all that he could hear. He had seen the devastation and the ruin and the mess that the nation was in. And what is crazy is that this evil king who knew his sinful ways, when he saw the deplorable situation of his nation. Instead of repenting for his sin of idolatry, he looked to kill the prophet of God. Y'all better hear what I'm teaching right here. This is exactly where we're living in America today. I want to tell you right now that, that the prophet with the word of the Lord is not the problem. 
<laughs> it's crazy how the preachers have all of a sudden become the issue. It's, pra- it's crazy how the truth has all of a sudden become the issue. See, the problem, that this is exactly what I would do if I were Satan. I would take what sets men free and I would try to demonize it and make it the enemy. As long as the enemy succeeds in making the world think that this book is the problem, they'll never get set free because truth is what makes men and women free. And there are people who think that truth and the prophetic word of the Lord are the problem. So here's what Jehoram said, let's kill the prophet. The Bible said he he actually said this, his head will come off today. Elisha, what a bad man. One man and a whole army came to see about him. And the, pro- the king said, today I'm going to cut his head off his shoulders. Why would he cut his head off? Because prophets are useless if they don't have a mouth. The enemy is always trying to cut the head off the prophetic voice of God in the nation. This is, this is crazy. Oh, I'm going to make some enemies right here, but come on and let me just do it in love. Hallelujah. This is, this is why you have entire denominations and movements of people who have rejected the office of a prophet. The enemy has succeeded in getting entire movements to write off a fifth or a fourth, however you look at it, of apostolic ministry. We don't believe in prophets. We can't control prophets. We don't like prophets, so let's silence prophets. The problem is if you silence the prophetic, you stay in the mess you're in. Religion will never be able to talk you out of bondage. Religion will never be able to talk you into breakthrough. Religion will never get us out of the mess we're in. If it could get us out, we would already be out. If more churches and more structure and more stuff could get us out of the mess, the nation would have already been out of the mess. The reason that we're still in a mess is because the only one that can break us through is the Holy Ghost, and he's the only one that we put over in a corner and told everybody we don't have time for him. Well, we have time for him. And I want you to know every Sunday we come together, there will always be time for him. Because this is not our dog and pony show. This is not my church. You are not my people. I don't own all y'all. I'm only here to make sure that we become everything that God has called us to be. Oh, God, help us. So, he... He says, we are in a mess and I'm going to kill the prophet for it. And so he sends a messenger down to see about Elisha. And the messenger is sitting, pardon me, the prophet Elisha is sitting in a room with the elders of Israel. And he's on death row. The man is on death row. And he's getting ready to be decapitated. And he still says, hear the word of the Lord. Because when you are gods, you do not stop prophesying simply because of the threat of harm. Yeah. We have prophets in this day and time who prophesy conveniently. In fact, we have people now who work hard to market their prophet ministry. I am prophet so-and-so. Where'd you come from? Don't worry about it. I'm prophet so-and-so. Who is your pastor? I don't believe in a pastor. Well, you you ain't a prophet if you can't submit to somebody. I'm not going to get no help in here. We have people who want authority and they want spiritual clout, but they don't want humility. We have people who want a title, but don't want a towel. They want to, they want to be honored, but don't want to honor. If you are called to preach, you probably ought to learn how to push a broom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Elisha, Elisha was not a prophet of convenience. He was a prophet who was committed to God. And while he was on death row getting ready to die, the Bible said that he looked at the elders of Israel and said, hear the word of the Lord. 
I'm going to give you three things that stick out to me about this text because this, this, this messed with me. Number one, you need to understand this. When he began to prophesy, there are three things about this prophetic word that I want to, to, to just submit to you today. Something happens when people begin to declare the word of the Lord. I've been teaching, Devin and I have been teaching for the last several weeks, even months, about being a prophetic people. Jesus. Because we have it wrong in the church that there are only two prophetic people in the house. How can a church of 1,500 people here and hundreds in Athens and, and Uruguay and, and, and Bulgaria, how can you be a church that big and only two people have a prophetic anointing? It's disgusting. It's, it's a, listen, and I'm not saying that, that that's what we are. I'm saying that's what some people think, that this is about one or two people. You understand that my job is not to preach in such a way that you see the anointing on my life. My job is to preach until the prophetic anointing gets activated and quickened in all of you. And there is a reason why the enemy is trying to squelch the prophetic in this hour. It is the word of the Lord that will combat the attack of the enemy. The enemy wants to attack. The enemy wants to choke out the life of God among the people of God. Listen to me. Every single week, I am not exaggerating. Pastor Richie can confirm it. Ryan can confirm it. Every single week, we're having to deal. I'm having to deal with another church shutting its doors. Another pastor who, who, who is losing everything. I am sick of it. I've cried. I've rolled in the floor. I've beat on the floor. I've, I, 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 keep, I keep hearing these things. And, and you say, Pastor, you just, you just need to chill out. No, the problem is not that we need to chill out. The problem is we need to get serious about the problem we're facing and quit acting like we're able to solve this in the strength of the flesh. We will never fix this mess in the strength of our flesh. We need the word of the Lord. And Elisha is on death row and he says, hear the word of the Lord. Three things I want you to hear in this prophecy. He says, tomorrow about this time, <laughs> Jesus, you're going to be able to find flour and barley in abundance. This is crazy, and there are three things about this I want you to see. Number one, and I'm going to run through these real quick. Number one, the first thing I want you to see is the word tomorrow. Isn't it amazing that no matter how many years they were besieged, they still had a tomorrow. Someone in this room today, you came today thinking, I don't know what tomorrow looks like. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and tell your neighbor, neighbor, you have a tomorrow. Come on, look at him and tell him, neighbor, I see you in your future. And you look better in your future than you do right now. That's why some people in this room are operating under a spirit of heaviness because you wake up every day feeling like you are a slave to the pain of tomorrow. I said the pain of tomorrow, the uncertainty of tomorrow, the shame of tomorrow, the fear of tomorrow. You're not excited about your future. I'm talking to somebody right now because you feel like your tomorrow is full of uncertainty. It is full of fear. It is full of shame. But I came today to tell you that devil is a liar. You do have a tomorrow. God is getting ready to blow your mind. God is getting ready to break you through. By this time tomorrow, tomorrow, are you for real? The sun will come out. Talk to me, Annie. I said, talk to me, Annie. If y'all won't listen to me preach, listen to Annie preach. The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. I came to tell you, you've had some pain, but God is getting ready to give you a purpose. You've had some mess, but God is going to give you a message. You have been at the bottom, but God is about to show you you never touched the bottom. He held you and he lifted, up, lifted you up with his right hand of righteousness. 
You have a tomorrow. That's the first thing I want you to see. You have a tomorrow. Stop listening to the voice of the enemy tell you you don't have a future. If you don't think you have a future, you remain a prisoner of your past. Number one, he said tomorrow. The second thing I want you to see about this prophecy, not only does he have a, not only does he have a tomorrow, but the second thing that I'm struck by is this, that what it took years for the enemy to destroy and damage, God can change it in 24 hours. If you don't like 24 hours, but I heard this before, good. Let me give you something new, 1,440 minutes. I feel a sassy anointing getting on me. If you don't like 1,440 minutes, how about 86,400 seconds? I just came to tell you that it doesn't take God as long to unscrew it as it did for the devil to screw it up. There ought to be like four of y'all shout or something over that. How many know that you can take step after step away from God, but all it takes is one turn back to God? Hey, and if you'll turn back to God, God can restore the years. Come down here. Let me come down here. Let me come down here and preach this thing. God can restore the years. The years that the palmer worm and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the locust destroyed. I'm not trying to tell you you ought to ruin your life. I'm here to tell you if you're sorry for your mess and you're over your failure and you want to get up, today is a good day for God to start all over in your life. Slap somebody, tell them, neighbor, God is not through with you. If they look at you funny, find another neighbor and tell that other neighbor, God is not through with you. He... He said, ooh, he, thank you, Holy Spirit. He said tomorrow about this time, it took that city years to be besieged, but God was about to shift the whole culture in one 24-hour period. Here's what's crazy. We say this in the church and doubt starts running into our mind. In fact, when I got this word this week, and Chris will tell you, I had a whole other sermon plan. It's a beaut. And God will release me sometime to preach it. But when God spoke this to me, my spirit man started leaping. I felt like I saw in prayer people start breaking through. I felt in prayer, I saw it in prayer. I saw cancers falling off of people. I saw marriage shandala bahosha. I saw marriages start breaking through. When I got this in prayer, I saw chains on people's mind start breaking and falling off. I saw people start lifting their hands. Some of you wanted to praise God today, but you didn't praise God. You allowed your shame and your reproach to keep you from praising the Lord. But God showed me in prayer this week that in 24 hours, this thing is getting ready to change for somebody. I came to tell you, it will not take God years to make you better. It will not take God years to, re to re help you recover. It will not take God years to therapy you through. God is about to take you out of the fire and put you in the midst of blessing. By this time tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, you're going to have abundance of barley and, and flour. And then the last thing I need to tell you is a warning. The first two things blessed you. This one's going to warn you. When Elisha prophesied and said, by this time tomorrow, Things are going to shift. There was a man on whose hand the king leaned. Now he was given access to the king. And he was in the ear of the king. 
And when Elisha prophesied and declared, by this time tomorrow it's going to shift, this man polluted the atmosphere with his unbelief. Now you better be careful here. And let me explain to you please the difference between unbelief and doubt. How many know there's a difference between unbelief and doubt? Doubt is simply double-mindedness. You understand that a double-minded man or a woman are unstable in all their ways. It doesn't mean that they don't have some faith. They do have it on one side. But a double-minded man also has another side. And the other side is the side of doubt. And if you feed the side of doubt, and you starve the side of faith, then you'll live in between this place of believing and not believing, of being sure and not being sure, of being convinced and not being convinced. That's doubt. Unbelief is no presence of faith at all. And there are people in the church who don't, they don't want to go to hell. <laughs> Look at your neighbor telling me, I don't want to go to hell. Come on, how many don't want to go to hell? Yeah. Y'all better get your hand up real quick. Come on. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want my enemies to go to hell. I don't want nobody I know to go to hell. But salvation is not just about you getting a get out of hell free card. Can't find no help here. God doesn't want you just to have belief that gets you saved. God wants you to have the kind of faith that unlocks supernatural life on the inside. And some people have enough faith, just enough faith to claim Jesus is Lord, but when you stand up and start praying for people on Sunday, they say things like, God ain't gonna heal nobody. I ain't never seen nobody get healed. I taught this past Wednesday night on demon possession. <laughs> Boy, that's a Wednesday night sermon. You can't preach that one on Sunday morning. You preach that message on Sunday morning, people are like, ooh, we got to get down to the restaurant. But the reality of it is, the, the, the Bible is clear. There are people sitting in places of worship that are full of devils. And our religion accommodates their bondage. And our pressure to perform keeps them bound. And if the Holy Ghost ever showed up and them things started manifesting, we don't have time in today's church to deliver people. But I came to tell I'm feeling this. This wasn't even in my notes. But somebody, you better hear me right now. And I'm different than them other preachers that tell you there's a witch in there church and I came to cast you out oh no if the witches came I came to tell you the blood will set you free oh! if you came to curse us you came too late if you came to try to shut the doors down it won't work the blood is against the devil and the people of God will always win somebody shout yes You ain't even had revival till the witch gets saved. I'm telling you, God's about to save demon-possessed warlocks, witches, the occult. They're coming out of a Ouija board and into the river of God. You better hear what I'm telling you. God is about to... I feel something in my feet right now. Oh, my shot. I need you to have faith. When we were in church and worshiping this morning, I heard the Lord say, I'm getting ready to take this whole house to another level. And as I turned around and watched, I saw people who've been on the edge of the river for a long time. I've seen them lifting hands, tears flowing in the middle of the river of God. I know we got a lot of new folk, and I know the culture is getting settled into your heart. But let me just tell you this right now. When you walk through those doors, you don't walk through those doors as a spectator. You don't walk through those doors to see a show. Hold on, ain't nobody sold you a ticket to get in here. They are not your performers that you are here to investigate and inspect. We did not come to sing so you could hear us. We came to sing because there is a king on the Lakosha Banda. There is a king among us. He is in this house. He is not low and broken. He is high and mighty. And I believe he's, I believe he's worthy of all the worship. I believe he's worthy of all the praise. I don't believe we ought to need a cheerleader to help us praise the Lord. I believe this is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice. We ought to rejoice. We ought to rejoice. I'm closing. 
the Bible said, the Bible said that he prophesied by this time tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, you're going to find abundance in what you lack right now. And the only one who didn't get to participate is the one who said, if the Lord opened the windows of heaven, could this thing even be so? Well, first of all, Joker, I'm glad you at least acknowledge God has some windows in heaven because the windows of heaven are open. You say, Pastor, how do you know it? Because my Bible said in the book of Malachi, the third chapter, do I have any tithers in this room? Yeah, well, I don't believe in tithing. Well, you don't have to believe in tithing, but we believe in tithing because the windows of heaven, the Bible said when you tithe, God will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he will open, he'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. Slap somebody, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, it's time for overflow. God is about to bless you in 24 hours. God is about to turn your situation around in 24 hours. By this time tomorrow, by this time tomorrow. But I don't know if that's real. I might not be talking to you, but somebody's been besieged. You feel like your life is being choked out. You feel like your marriage is going through hell. It looks like your children are losing the faith. What's about to happen? God is about to turn it around. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Somebody give him praise in the building. Somebody give him praise in the building. He don't need 10 years. He don't need a new president. He don't need a Republican Congress and a Democratic Senate. He'll turn it around in 24 Oh, I'm through. I'm through. I'm through. But I want you to see this. God said in 24 hours, I'm through preaching. God said in 24 hours, it's going to be a different culture. Lack is going to be broken. <laughs> eating, eating donkey heads and dove dung is over. Look at somebody tell them, I don't need that anymore. I don't need that anymore. I survived on that, but I'm not going into survival mode. I said, I'm not living in survival mode. I'm coming into a place of abundance in Jesus. If I'm preaching to you, shout yes. Watch this. The Bible said, the Bible said that the next day, nobody knew it had happened. Here's what's crazy. It had already happened like God said, but nobody knew it. And there were four lepers. Come here, you're a leper. Come here, Jim, you're a leper. Come here, Pastor Tim. Come here, Jody. Come here, all y'all lepers. Come here. A bunch of lepers. Come up on the stage. Come up on the stage. Come on, come on. Come up on the stage. Come up on the stage. We didn't practice this, so forgive us if it don't work like I think it's going to work. Here are four lepers. The city of Samaria is on the other side of this gate. That's besieged. Behind them is Aram, the, the, the city of Syria. Mm. They, they are outside the gate of the city. And if you know anything about lepers, they are rejected by society. Their sickness was one of skin uh, uh, a skin sickness and literally what happens is when you get leprosy it begins to devour your skin and it completely erodes the covering 
And so what we have here in the spirit is a picture of an uncovered group of men. And they are losing their covering. I'm through preaching, I promise. Just say standing. And so they're uncovered. And they, they say to themselves, if we go into that city, we will die of starvation like everybody else. If we stay here, we're going to die. So what if we go to the camp of Syria and what if they have mercy? Come on. I feel like preaching in the house this morning. Touch your neighbor, tell them neighbor, what if mercy? What if mercy? What if God wasn't getting ready to kill you? What if God was getting ready to show you mercy? Look at your friend right now next to you and say, neighbor, tell him I got good news for you. His mercies are new every morning. New every morning. If you get up this morning and make up your mind, you're not going to die where you are. And you're not going back to where God brought you from. I might lose it all, but I might find mercy. Somebody give God a praise for mercy. Watch this, watch this. Four broke down lepers. Stay standing, I'm through preaching. And here's what they said. We're not going to end there to die. And we're not going to sit here till we die. Let's go in to the camp and see if they'll show mercy. So, so watch this. They started walking toward the camp of Syria. Big steps, ready? Dante, where you at? We ain't dead yet. Let's take some more steps, come on. Here's what's crazy. These were four lepers. And every step they took in the natural, God Whoa. magnified the sound. I'm going home. Ah, y'all my son. The Bible said, come on brothers, let's walk some more. Every step they took toward mercy, God magnified the sound of their step in the ears of Syria. And the Bible said God made Syria hear a How? God made Syria hear a noise. God made Syria hear a noise. God made Syria hear a noise. I came to tell somebody, if you praise God, he'll make your enemy hear a noise. Oh. Breakthrough. Somebody make a noise. Somebody make a noise. Make a noise for your marriage. Make a noise for your children. Make a noise. Make a noise for your business. Make a noise for your church. Somebody make. Yeah! Yes! Yes! Praise Him! 24 hours from now, it's getting ready to shift! Praise Him! Praise Him! Praise Him! Throw your hands up! Open up your mouth! Give God praise! I feel a breakthrough. Oh, no. He, woo. Watch this. Where are my lepers at? Come here. The Bible said that they went in to the camp of the enemy. And they looked around and they couldn't find an enemy. The only thing they found was the spoil. Lord have mercy, I feel like preaching. My Bible said the wealth of the wicked is laid up.
It wasn't the bishop that got the breakthrough. It wasn't the apostle that got the leftover. It wasn't the prophet that got the spoil. It was four broke down lepers who didn't have anybody but God. Slap somebody in your zip code and say, neighbor, things are about to change. Things are about to change. It hadn't changed in a long time, but weeping only indoors for a night. Joy, joy, joy. Joy comes in the morning. I'm through, but these four lepers came in and the first thing that happened is their famine got broken. Their famine got broken before everybody else's got broken. And they started eating and feasting and then they started finding gold furniture. Where are you going? I'm going to hide. So they go home and, and they go back and they take their gold out and they put it there and all of a sudden conviction gets on them. And they said, we can't do this. This is a secret right now. But we need to go tell Israel that their enemy has been dealt with. I'm going home, but look at somebody near you and tell your neighbor, say neighbor. The inner, come on, I know y'all don't like talking to your neighbor, but some of you don't prophesy throughout the week, so I'm helping you prophesy right now. Look at your near neighbor and say, hey neighbor, your enemy has been dealt with. He's not gonna be dealt with. He's not going to be defeated. He's not going to leave. He's already been defeated. He's already been dealt with. When Jesus hung on the cross, he didn't say, I'll, I'll pick it back up next time. He said, it is finished. Stop somebody tell your neighbor, it is finished. They went back. They went back and they told all of Israel. You ready? You ready? I want y'all four to go down through there and start telling everybody. Things are about to change. Things are about to change. Things are about to change. And when they tell you, I want you to turn around and tell somebody, things are about to change. Things are about to change. Hurry, tell somebody, things are about to change. Things are about to change. Come on, keep on telling somebody. And when somebody tells you, turn around and tell somebody else, things are about to change. I know it's been a mess, but things are about to change. I know it looks like the nation's in trouble, but things are about to change. By this time tomorrow, you know the Messiah. I'm gonna be possible. I'm gonna be a Messiah. By this time tomorrow. Oh, somebody give God praise. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Somebody give him pride! Listen, I felt an instruction from the Lord. I wasn't being funny. If somebody told you it's about to change, I want you to find somebody and tell them it's about to change. If you haven't done that yet, that's your responsibility right now. And, then, and when somebody tells you it's about to change, you turn around and tell somebody else it's about to change. It's about to change. Tell them till they get all the way to the back row. Tell them till they get all the way to the back row. And when this thing hits the back row, I want everybody from the front to the back, from the left to the right, I want everybody to praise God that you believe in 24 hours, 86,400 seconds, 1,440 minutes, God is about to turn it. God is about to turn it. God is about to turn it. After the breakthrough, after the 
breakthrough! After the breakthrough! After the breakthrough! Take 60 more seconds and praise God! It's about to turn around! Give him one more shot of pray! Give him one more shot of pray! To God! Because tomorrow, about this time, I tried to tell y'all, tomorrow, about this time, I said tomorrow, about this time, things, things are gonna change. Somebody prophesy before we leave here today. Say tomorrow, put it in your atmosphere tomorrow. Oh, 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 tomorrow Things are gonna change Sing it one more time Tomorrow Everybody sing to Tomorrow We're going to sing that one more time. I'm going to let you go. If you connect with this message and believe it was for you and your house and your life, I need you to throw both hands up right now in faith. In faith. Yes. 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 Tomorrow. Some people is. It's going to happen by tomorrow about this time. And what I want you to understand is that the only thing that had to happen is you had to keep the faith. Don't get full of skepticism and unbelief in this hour. This is the hour of believing God. How many are going to believe God? I said, how many are going to believe God? I want to... I want to stretch my hands out toward you and pray for you that the Lord would strengthen everybody's faith. And then we're going to sing this as you go and get back tonight at six if you can. Devin and I are going to minister. I believe the Lord's going to keep, he's just pouring it out. And I don't want to be, I don't want to miss what he's doing. Get back tonight at six. But Father, I pray for the strength of their faith. I thank you that in due season they will reap if they faint not according to the book of Galatians. And Father, some of them felt like fainting, but they're going to keep on believing. And because they decided to believe your word, you are activating miracles in the next 24 hours, in the next 24 hours, in the next 86,400 seconds, in the next 1,440 minutes. 
God is going to work something supernatural for you. I declare your house is coming into alignment with the purpose of God. I declare your family is coming into alignment. Your business is coming into purpose, into blessing. Tomorrow. I didn't preach this because I needed a sermon. I preached this because we're in a moment right now. We've stepped into something I believe in the spirit where God is going to begin to activate destiny. Destiny. And I'm going to obey God here. But this dear brother right here, just put your hands together like that. Yes, would you two come here? I don't know you. Come here. I just want to obey God. I just want to pray for you. I keep feeling like God's about to do something in your life and there's something with, with, and, and I, I, God, I just obey you here. But I think it's, I see it happening with some children. Does this make sense? But by this time tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, I feel like the enemy tried to besiege your life. He tried to choke some things out, but by this time tomorrow, Holy Ghost, I declare life over her right now. I declare life over this house right now. And the Lord says a spirit of death has been broken and life, in the name of Jesus. Somebody lift your hands. Come on, Pastor Tobin and Pastor Jojo. Tomorrow about this time, tomorrow about this time. Somebody sing tomorrow about this time. Ay, 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 ay. Things are going to change. One more time, I love you. I'm going to let you go. I'll see you tonight at six. Come on, tomorrow. Tonight at six. Tomorrow about this time. Tomorrow. Things are going to change. Things are gonna... If you need a job, throw your hands up. If you need a new job, throw your hands up. Tomorrow about this time. Yes, tomorrow. I believe it, I believe it, Lord. If you need a financial breakthrough, throw your hands up and sing tomorrow. Listen, I believe that God is speaking to hearts right now. If you've watched this message today and something said, brought strength to you and built you up in your spirit, gave you hope for tomorrow, I thank God that in this day and hour that we're living that there is a word from the Lord. And the Bible tells us we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We need the word of the Lord. And today this word, I pray, has produced faith in your heart. You want someone to agree with you in prayer right now. I want to take this moment to pray with everyone watching because I believe God's going to meet needs today. If you're lost and you feel like you're full of hopelessness and sin, just call on the name of the Lord. If you're sick in your body and you need him to touch you, you just call on the name of the Lord. If your family's falling apart and you need God to rescue your family, I want you to know there's a miracle for your family, for those of you who are watching today. Let's pray together. Father, move by your spirit right now. Someone's reaching out to you in faith, God. They need a miracle today. They need you to turn their situation around. I thank you that there's no impossibility. There's no problem too hard for you to solve. There's no mountain too big for you to move, Lord. Do it for them today. We agree together in prayer in Jesus' name that lives are being changed right now by the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Be blessed. Check us out on kevinwallace.tv, and I'll see you next week. God bless.